What we're going to do now is piggyback on our discussion on the heart and on the broader level on the cardiovascular system. Quick review, the cardiovascular system consists of the heart, which is the pump, blood vessels, which are the conduits through which blood is traveling, and then certainly blood, which is the medium that entities travel in. That is to say ions, glucose, plasma proteins, what have you. This lecture is going to focus on blood vessels. And what we have here is a very basic, totally unrealistic schematic of the blood vessels which leave the heart and return to the heart. Blood vessels that are leaving the heart are arteries, vessels that are returning to the heart and specifically returning blood back to the heart are veins. Arteries are carrying oxygen-rich blood, veins are carrying oxygen-poor blood. In between the two, we find a capillary bed. A capillary is a type of blood vessel that tends to be congregated together with a litany of other capillaries, hence the name capillary bed, which is a collection or congregation of capillaries. And capillaries is where exchange occurs. If we're just talking about gas exchange, when arterial blood gets to the capillary bed, oxygen leaves the capillary bed to move into the interstitial space and then immediately into the cells that are going to utilize that oxygen. Accordingly, those cells are going to give off carbon dioxide, which then moves into the capillary bed, and then the venous end of the circulation moving back to the heart. So we're going to focus on blood vessels, what they're composed of, the different types of blood vessels, or some other very interesting adaptations our blood vessels have. Very briefly, this is a blood vessel, not really any specific type of blood vessel. Keep in mind, Blood vessels contain blood, which is the median, and within the blood, we'll detail components of blood in a later video, but it's going to be water, blood plasma, and blood cells, otherwise known as formed elements, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. There's going to be nutrients such as glucose, ions, hormones, among other things. And just to be clear on the role of blood, the role of blood is to circulate things, ions, molecules, what have you, like I just things I just mentioned that were in the blood previously, to transport them throughout the body. And traditionally, I start with the heart, I end with a capillary bed, and it's a cycle between the heart and the capillary beds, which is mildly unrealistic because there are other components of our organ systems that contribute to and collaborate with our bloodstream. So what we see here on the left is our GI tract. And really all I want you to take home from this particular image right here is that digestive products get absorbed into our bloodstream. During digestion, after consuming food products, our digestive system breaks those things down into their constituent parts, carbohydrates, amino acids, monosaccharides, fats, what have you. And all of that is absorbed into our bloodstream. This would include alcohol, drugs, anything that is consumed. So absorption is the movement of digestive products into our bloodstream. Once they're into our in our bloodstream, then they can be distributed throughout our body, move to the liver, and be made good use of. So please keep in mind that there are a number of organ systems that partake or collaborate with our bloodstream and cardiovascular system. And just adding to that, don't worry about the details of this image. What this is showing is the endocrine system, specifically the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, and the thyroid gland. And the take home message here is that hormones get distributed through blood vessels from point A to point B. And to be clear, if we can remember back to any lectures on the endocrine system, let's just take TRH, for example, which is thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, that moves to the anterior pituitary via capillary bed, via the bloodstream, via a blood vessel known as a capillary. 
that's going to stimulate the release of TSH, which moves into the bloodstream via blood vessels to the thyroid gland. So blood vessels are extremely important for distributing a number of entities throughout the body. And just taking a closer look at a capillary bed, don't worry about the plasma proteins here and really the fluid that's coming out of the capillary bed. Fluid does move out of capillary beds, but moves right back into the capillary beds. We will talk about those details more in a human physiology course. But what I'm trying to show here is once the blood gets to a capillary bed, and capillary beds are distributed throughout the whole body with the exception exception of places like tendons, ligaments, cartilage, the cornea and lens of the eye. But most places have a great abundance of capillary beds because those capillary beds are going to fuel or help perfuse tissues throughout the body with oxygen and nutrients and hormones and things traveling through the bloodstream. So capillaries are where exchange occurs or the distribution or drop off of nutrients to the tissues. Okay, so here is just a very basic schematic of a blood vessel. So we have two broad categories of blood, blood vessels, arteries and veins. Capillaries are somewhat in their own category, and we'll talk about at length about those. Small arteries are known as arterioles. Small veins are known as venules. But arteries and veins are made up of the same basic components. And that's what we see right here. We see a blood vessel down here on the left. And here we see a cross section of that blood vessel. And this is what we're really going to use to describe the layers or tunics of a blood vessel. Right here would be the lumen of the blood vessel. And when I say the term lumen, I am referring to the space within a blood vessel that blood is flowing through. So the blood is going to flow through the lumen and push up against the walls of the lumen. The innermost layer of a blood vessel is known as the tunica intima, otherwise known as the tunica interna. And that's composed of simple squamous epithelial tissue that we have a special moniker for known as endothelium. Endothelium is the simple squamous epithelial tissue that lines all blood vessels. And it's the same tissue, same type of tissue that lines the chambers of the heart. So we talked about lining the chambers of the heart, the right left atrium and right and left ventricle. The lining of those chambers is known as endocardium, and that is simple squamous epithelial tissue. As a matter of fact, the endocardium of the left ventricle is contiguous or continuous with the simple squamous of blood vessels, otherwise known as the endothelium. So the endocardium of the heart is continuous with the endothelium of the arteries leaving the heart. So once again, the endothelium is composed of simple squamous epithelial tissue. And like all simple squamous epithelial tissue, there is a basement membrane that underlies that simple squamous epithelial tissue the basement membrane is composed of both a basal lamina and a reticular lamina. In purple here is the middle layer of blood vessels, and that's known as the tunica media. And that is composed of smooth muscle, collagen, and for some blood vessels, there are elastic fibers within the tunica media. But the basis of the tunica media of all blood vessels is that it is composed of smooth muscle. And to be clear, not all blood vessels have a tunica media. Some actually lack the smooth muscle. But in general, the tunica media of blood vessels is composed of smooth muscle, mainly smooth muscle, with some collagen, and with some specific blood vessels, an abundance of elastic fibers. The smooth muscle allows for vasomotion of blood vessels. And vasomotion is adjusting the diameter of the lumen of the blood vessel. If the diameter gets larger, that is no, known as vasodilation. If the diameter of the blood vessel gets smaller, that is known as vasoconstriction. Vasodilation 
increases the volume of a blood vessel. And accordingly, that will decrease the pressure within that blood vessel. Keep in mind, an increase in volume corresponds with a decrease in pressure. That is when we're talking about a chamber. And previously, when we were talking about volume and pressure, I was referring to the chambers of the heart. But we can consider the blood vessel a chamber or a space that behaves the principles, the universal principles of volume and pressure. That is to say, as volume increases, pressure goes down. As volume decreases, pressure goes up. So when a blood vessel vasodilates, pressure is going to decrease in that blood vessel. When a blood vessel vasoconstricts, pressure is going to increase in that blood vessel. And by the tunica media, specifically the smooth muscle of the blood vessels engaging in vasodilation or vasoconstriction, those blood vessels can inform the body where blood should go and where it should not go. And certainly the nervous system is playing a very important part in regulating the vasomotion of blood vessels. And to be clear, we don't always need the nervous system to play a part in that because there are paracrine and autocrine agents that do that on their own. We will delve more deeply into that within a physiology course of blood vessels. And the outermost layer, which we see in blue here, and is known as the tunica adventitia, otherwise known as the tunica externa, it's composed of loose connective tissue. It helps anchor blood vessels. And when I say anchor, blood vessels are not just loosely flowing within the body. They are bound to each other. So a lot of veins and arteries are co connected to each other via the tunica adventitia. And they can be bound to or supported by or anchored to surrounding organs or tissues. Okay, so what we're looking at here are different types of arteries. I have these written from largest to smallest. And the largest ones are the ones closest to the heart. For example, the aorta is a conducting artery that's coming directly off of the heart. And meta arterioles are the arteries furthest away from the heart, right at the capillary beds. They are not the capillaries, but they are the last artery arterial vessel that blood leaves before moving into the capillary beds. So these conducting arteries are distributing, body, are distributing blood throughout the whole body and not really to a specific organ, but to specific regions of the body. So the aorta is going to move blood down the thoracic cavity into the abdominal cavity. The carotid artery is moving blood up to the brain. The iliac arteries are moving blood into the pelvic cavity. So those are all examples of conducting arteries, which are large elastic arteries. They contain a lot of elastic fibers. And these elastic fibers are going to allow arteries to expand and recoil. So the characteristic of elasticity is the ability to return to its original shape after stretching. And the elastic fibers within these large conducting arteries allow for that. So we're going to look at an image in a bit here that shows something known as arterial rebound, which is a facet of these large conducting arteries that is very important in maintaining systemic blood pressure. We have distributing arteries, and these can be thought of as going to specific organs. The gastric artery is taking blood to the stomach. The renal artery is taking blood specific to the kidneys, and it can just be taking blood to specific regions, such as the brachial artery to the upper arm or the femoral artery to the femur region of the leg. The resistance arteries are the arteries within specific organs or regions of the body. So we'll look at another image of these resistant arteries specific to the renal system. So we will have a distributing artery that branches off one of the major conducting arteries. So for example, the aorta 
as I suggested, is a conducting artery. It's a very large elastic artery. Coming off of that is going to be a distributing artery going directly to the kidneys. And then the resistance arteries are the arteries, the much smaller artery, arteries within the kidney. And then lastly, we have meta arterioles, which connect the resistance arteries to the capillary beds. And these meta arterioles are unique to arteries in that they have these circular smooth muscle on the outside of the blood vessel that act as sphincters that regulate blood flow into the capillary bed. So if there's a tissue with a capillary bed that does not need blood flow to it, it does not need more oxygen or nutrients, those precapillary sphincters of the meta arterioles are going to constrict, occlude, and cut off the blood flow to that capillary bed. So we can use that blood in other parts of the body. It helps divert blood to areas in greater need of the oxygen and nutrients. In this image, I just want to show what's known as a vasa vasorum, and that is a blood vessel for a blood vessel. So what we see right here is in light green is the endothelium, the simple squamous epithelial tissue lining the blood vessel. In purple here would be the basement membrane. In orange is the tunica media. And keep in mind the endothelium is the tunica intima, tunica media, the smooth muscle. And then in blue would be the tunica adventitia or tunica externa. So keep in mind that one of the main goals of the cardiovascular system is to perfuse the body with oxygen. So all the organs and all the tissues can have ample supply of oxygen. And that includes these blood vessels. The blood vessels need oxygen just as much as other tissues of the body. And maybe that was somewhat hyperbolic. Not all tissues need oxygen as much as other tissues. But the living, breathing cells that make up blood vessels re require nutrients. So a number of those nutrients and oxygen for the blood vessel itself can be achieved via diffusion from the blood flowing through the lumen of the blood vessel. But we have discussed that there are limits to the distance things can diffuse throughout the body. So the distance between the lumen, as we see right here, to the outside of this blood vessel is much too long for these molecules, ions, and gases to diffuse. So what happens here is we have a blood vessel right here known as the vasovasorum that is providing and perfusing the outer parts of the blood vessel with oxygen and nutrients. So the vasovasorum is a blood vessel for a larger blood vessel. Smaller blood vessels don't require a vasovasorum because the distance between the lumen and the outermost layer, the tunica adventitia, is small enough that they can gain their oxygen and nutrients via diffusion. Here's a schematic of the aorta, which is a large conducting artery. This is the aorta. Coming off the aorta on both sides is going to be a right and left renal artery. And those are the distributing arteries specific to the renal system. Renal refers to the kidneys or the urinary system. And then once inside the kidneys, we have the resistance arterioles, which are blood vessels specific to this organ, in this case, the right kidney. Coming off of those resistance arterioles are going to be meta arterioles and capillaries, which we'll talk about briefly here. And what I want to show here is a huge role of the elastic fibers of large conduction conductance arteries. Once again, we suggested that the smooth muscle of the tunica media is laden with a bunch of elastic fibers. And this is somewhat variable depending on the arteries and the size of the arteries. But the large conducting arteries have great elasticity to them. And it functions or it's there to serve a very specific purpose that is known as arterial rebound. So if we look at the blood vessel at the top, what we have right here, this is representing 
the left ventricle, the bottom, this is the left ventricle as well, but let's focus on the top right here. This is displaying the left ventricle during left ventricular contraction, otherwise known as systole. So the heart, specifically the left ventricle in this case, is engaged in systole, contraction of the left ventricle. Now, when the left ventricle contracts, there's very high pressure leaving the left ventricle and the arteries closest to the left ventricle are exposed to very high pressure, 120 millimeters of mercury and upwards, depending on the situation with the individual. That pressure is so high that it could wreak havoc with the more fragile blood vessels downstream, the smaller arterioles or the capillary beds. So our body needs to control the pressure before it heads downstream. And also it helps regulate the flow of pressure throughout the whole body. So what happens during ventricular systole is these large elastic arteries expand. And that's what we're showing right here with these blue arrows. Think of something like the carotid artery, the aorta. They will expand. And by the volume of the blood vessel expanding, the volume of the chamber is increasing, causing the pressure in that particular region of the cardiovascular system to decrease. And this may seem somewhat counterintuitive because the goal of the left ventricle is to develop enough pressure to push blood throughout the whole body. But once again, this expansion of these large elastic arteries are going to, one, help protect the fragile capillaries downstream, but they're also going to function as a pressure reservoir to help utilize or recapture that pressure when the heart is no longer pumping. So the pressure decreases in the large elastic arteries during ventricular systole because the volume of that artery has increased, pressure has decreased. During ventricular diastole or relaxation that we see down here, the volume of the ventricle increases, pressure decreases. So one challenge the cardiovascular system might have if we didn't have these elastic arteries is that blood flow would come to a screeching halt during ventricular diastole or when the heart is no longer pumping. And without a doubt, arterial blood flow is moves in a pulsating manner as a result of the action of the heart. But the cardiovascular system allows for continued blood flow diminished as it is due to the arterial rebound of these large elastic arteries. So during ventricular diastole, these large elastic arteries recoil to a smaller size, a smaller diameter. And by doing that, the decrease in volume of these large elastic arteries are going to increase the pressure from what it was. So let's suggest that the pressure here was 120 millimeters of mercury when it was expanded. But down here, it's recoiled, and now we're at roughly 90. It's not necessarily going to be more than what was up here during ventricular systole, but it's not going to drop precipitously during relaxation of the ventricles. As a result, blood continues getting pushed downstream, and the pressure moving downstream is not so extreme that it will hinder or compromise the fragile capillaries downstream. This is arterial rebound. The expansion of large elastic arteries during ventricular systole and the recoil of these large elastic arteries during ventricular diastole. Okay, what I want to show with this image is the meta arterial that I talked about, which is the most distal end of the arterial blood supply. The meta arterial is providing blood to the capillary beds. And at the entrance to the capillaries coming off the meta arterials, we see these pre capillary sphincters. If the, the tissue in question right here doesn't need the oxygen and nutrients, 
those precapillary sphincters will clamp down occluding and blocking the entrance to the capillaries. And when I say if the tissue doesn't need the oxygen and nutrients, the other side of that coin is if other tissues in the broad in the body, say the brain and our vital organs need it more than this tissue, then those precapillary sphincters are going to clamp down, prevent blood flow into the capillary. The blood will then flow through this thoroughfare and move on to other areas of the body. So here we see coming off the base of the heart is the aorta. And in the aorta, we can see a couple of these green spots and some of these yellow markings right here. And these are representing specific receptors of the aorta and the carotid arteries. So in yellow, we have what are known as baroreceptors, specifically known as the aortic sinus. And what not shown here, there are also carotid sinuses. And these are baroreceptors that are detecting changes in blood, in blood pressure throughout the arterial system, specifically in the aorta and the carotid artery. These are great places to have sensors or receptors that monitor levels of blood pressure because one, the artery is the first pressure leaving the left ventricle, and two, the carotid artery is providing blood to arguably the most important and valuable organ in the body, and that is the brain. These baroreceptors are activated when these vessels expand. It sends a message to the cardiovascular center in the brainstem, specifically the vasomotor center and the cardiac center in the medulla oblongata, which eventually tell the heart to decrease its rate, its firing, and dilate blood vessels. So if, we, if our body has elevated blood pressure detected by the baroreceptors in the carotid artery, which are known as the carotid sinuses, or in the aorta, which are known as the aortic sinuses, that's going to send a signal to the brain. The brain's going to then send a signal to the heart to decrease heart rate and send a signal to the blood vessels to cause vasodilation. Keep in mind, if the body is exhibiting elevated blood pressure, if the blood vessels vasodilate, the volume of the blood vessels get larger and the pressure in the blood vessel is going to decrease. In green, that's representing what are known as chemoreceptors. In this case, these are aortic bodies. We have chemoreceptors in the carotid arteries as well, known as carotid bodies. And these are chemoreceptors that are monitoring specific chemicals in the body, such as carbon dioxide, oxygen, and the hydrogen ion, or pH. So these chemoreceptors, the carotid and aortic bodies, are evaluating any changes in pH, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. Once again, pH is a measurement of the hydrogen ion concentration in the body. And as you will learn in a physiology course, the levels of the hydrogen ion in the body, or pH, is highly correlated to levels of carbon dioxide in the body and certainly levels of oxygen. Okay, so let's talk about veins. Veins are similar to arteries. The biggest difference is veins do not have as thick a tunica media. That is to say, they have much less smooth muscle in their tunica media, much less elastic fibers, if any. Veins are not exposed to high pressure. So when blood leaves the hearts in the large elastic arteries, it's exposed to very high pressure. And the average pressure within large arteries is something like 95 millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury are just the units that pressure is measured in the body. The average pressure within veins is about 10 millimeters of mercury. So it's exposed to very, very low pressure. As a result, it doesn't need the large smooth muscle of the tunica media to help maintain its structural integrity or protect itself 
from exposure to high pressure levels. There's much more fluid volume in veins than in arteries. Upwards of 50% of our systemic circulation is found within the venous system, while only 10% or a little bit more are within the arteries. And then of course, in between those are the capillary veins. The post-capillary venules are the beginning of the venous end of the circulation leaving capillaries. They're very similar to capillaries. Exchange can even occur within the capillaries, excuse me, within the post-capillary venules, though most of it happens directly within the capillaries. And these post-capillary venules have no muscle, so they are just endothelium with the basement membrane. Then we have the medium veins, which are things like the femoral vein, the splenic vein, gastric veins, and these median, medium veins have valves in them very similar to the semilunar valves of the heart, which are going to help prevent backflow of blood in the venous system. Keep in mind that these veins are very low pressure, so they need all the help they can get to help propel that blood superiorly back to the heart. I'll show an image of these veins in a moment, but they are just valves that are created by the tunica intima. And then the large veins are things like the superior inferior vena cava, pulmonary vein, and jugular vein. Another type of vein we have are venous sinuses. We talked about the coronary sinus of the hearts. And the venous sinuses contain no smooth muscle. Any blood vessel that has no smooth muscle they are incapable of engaging in any sort of vasomotion, which is vasodilation or vasoconstriction. So the coronary sinus is an example of one of the venous sinuses. There's also the superior sagittal sinus in the dura of the brain that helps collect blood, leaving the brain heading back to the heart via the internal external jugular veins. Here's an image of a vein in green. Specifically, this is one of the median veins. And the tunica intima creates these valves that we see right here. And these are one-way valves. And this is just showing blood flow from the big toe back to the heart. And to move back to the heart, this blood must move through these valves back to the heart. If pressure ever decreases so low that blood can't flow, we don't want that blood going back to the big toe. And that's where these valves come in. They will capture that blood and prevent any return of that blood down to the lower extremity. So these valves are part of these median veins that are created by the tunica intima. Okay, what we're seeing in this image right here is a cross-section of three different types of capillaries. Keep in mind, a capillary is a blood vessel where exchange of gases occur, where the cardiovascular system is dropping off nutrients, hormones, what have you, to the tissues. Capillaries are composed of the tunica intima, but specifically just the endothelium and the basal lamina. The basal lamina is just part of the basement membrane. It's lacking the reticular lamina of the basement membrane. So simplistically, the capillaries are merely the endothelium and they range in diameter of five to nine micrometers. Keep in mind a red blood cell, which has to pass through these capillaries is about seven and a half micrometers. As a result, those red blood cells actually have to squeeze and distort themselves just to get through these very small and fragile capillary beds. And once again, capillary beds are found just about everywhere in the body with the exception of tendons, ligaments, cartilage, hence the reason why those tissues, when we hurt them, tear them, aggravate them, have such a hard time in repairing themselves. And the capillaries are also absent from the lens of the eye and the cornea of the eye. So once again, these are cross sections of three different types of capillaries. The one on the top is showing a continuous capillary. 
where these endothelial cells overlap with each other, as you can see right up in here. And that allows for substances to move in and out of the capillary bed. We also have what's known as a fenestrated capillary. So there are the clefts between the cells, but there are these pores or fenestrations amongst the endothelial cells that allow even greater transports across the endothelium. So we have the continuous capillary right here, the fenestrated capillary right here, and one that's known as a discontinuous capillary that's extremely porous, allowing things to move in and out of the blood vessels or in and out of the capillary that normally would not be allowed to, specifically plasma proteins. And when we get into talking about the makeup of blood, one of the entities within the blood, floating within the blood plasma are plasma proteins, which have a great, a great variety of roles within the cardiovascular system. But these plasma proteins are quite large and cannot leave or enter the bloodstream in any of these two types of capillaries, the continuous or fenestrated. But the discontinuous allows the passage of the large plasma proteins. And we're going to see that within the liver where plasma proteins are synthesized and then can move directly into the bloodstream via these discontinuous capillaries. Okay, more on blood vessels to come.